The author of these travels, Mr. Lemuel Gulliver, is my ancient and intimate friend. There is likewise some relation between us on the mother's side. About three years ago, Mr. Gulliver, growing weary of the concourse of curious people, coming to him at his house in Red Riff, made a small purchase of land, with a convenient house near Newark in Nottinghamshire, his native country, where he now lives retired, yet in good esteem among his neighbours. Although Mr. Gulliver was born in Nottinghamshire, where his father dwelt, yet I have heard him say his family come from Oxfordshire, to confirm which, I have observed in the churchyard at Banbury, in that county, several tombs and monuments of the Gullivers. Before he quitted Redriff, he left the custody of the following papers in my hands, with the liberty to dispose of them as I should think fit. I have carefully perused them three times. The style is very plain and simple, and the only fault I find is, that the author, after the manner of travellers, is a little too circumstantial. There is an air of truth apparent through the whole, and indeed the author was so distinguished for his veracity, that it became a sort of proverb among his neighbours at Redriff, when any one affirmed a thing, to say, it was as true as if Mr. Gulliver had spoken it. By the advice of several worthy persons, to whom, with the author's permission, I communicated these papers, I now venture to send them into the world, hoping they may be, at least for some time, a better entertainment to a young nobleman than the common scribbles of politics and party. This volume would have been at least twice as large, if I had not made bold to strike out innumerable passages relating to the winds and tides, as well as to the variations and bearings in the several voyages, together with the minute descriptions of the management of the ship in storms, in the style of sailors, likewise the account of longitudes and latitudes, wherein I have reason to apprehend that Mr. Gulliver may be a little dissatisfied. But I was resolved to fit the work as much as possible to the general capacity of readers. However, if my own ignorance in sea affairs shall have led me to commit some mistakes, I alone am answerable for them. And if any traveller hath a curiosity to see the whole work at large, as it comes from the hands of the author, I will be ready to gratify him. As for any further particulars relating to the author, the reader will receive satisfaction from the first page of the book. Richard Simpson A letter from Captain Gulliver to his cousin Simpson Written in the year 1727 I hope you will be ready to own publicly, whenever you shall be called to it, that by your great and frequent urgency you prevailed on me to publish a very loose and uncorrect account of my travels with directions to hire some young gentleman of either university to put them in order and correct the style, as my cousin Dampier did, by my advice, in his book called A Voyage Around the World. But I do not remember I gave you power to consent that anything should be omitted, and much less that anything should be inserted, therefore, as to the latter, I do here renounce everything of that kind, particularly a paragraph about Her Majesty Queen Anne, of the most pious and glorious memory although I did reverence and esteem her more than any of human species. But you, or your interpolator, ought to have considered that it was not my inclination. So it was not decent to praise any animal of our composition before my master, Huynhem. And besides, the fact was altogether false. For, to my knowledge, being in England during some part of Her Majesty's reign, she did govern by a chief minister, nay, even by two successively, the first whereof was the Lord Goldefen, and the second the Lord of Oxford, so that you have made me say the thing that was not. Likewise, in the account of the Academy of Projectors, and several passages of my discourse to my master, Huin on Hem, you have either omitted some material circumstances, or minced or changed them in such a manner, that I do hardly know my own work. When I formally hinted to you something of this in a letter, you were pleased to answer that you were afraid of giving offence, that people in power were very watchful over the press, and apt not only to interrupt, but to punish everything which looked like an innuendo, as I think you call it. But pray, how could that which I spoke so many years ago, and at about five thousand leagues distance, in another reign, be applied to any of the Yahoos who are now said to govern the herd? 
especially at a time when I little thought, or feared, the unhappiness of living under them. Have I not the most reason to complain? When I see these very yahoos, carried by Huinonhems in a vehicle, as if they were brutes, and those the rational creatures, and indeed to avoid so monstrous and detestable a sight, was one principal motive of my retirement hither. Thus much I thought proper to tell you in relation to yourself, and to the trust I reposed in you. I do, in the next place, complain of my own great want of judgment, in being prevailed upon by the entreaties and false reasoning of you and some others, very much against my own opinion, to suffer my travels to be published. Pray bring to your mind how often I desired you to consider, when you insisted on the motive of public good, that the yahoos were a species of animal utterly incapable of amendment by precipice or example. And so it has proved. For, instead of seeing a full stop put to all abuses and corruptions, at least in this little island, as I had reason to expect, behold, after above six months' warning, I cannot learn that my book has produced one single effect according to my intentions. I desired you would let me know, by a letter, when party and faction were extinguished, judges learned and upright, pleaders honest and modest, with some tincture of common sense, and Smithfield blazing with pyramids of law-books, the young nobility's education entirely changed, the physicians banished, the female yahoos abounding in virtue, honour, truth, and good sense, courts and levies of great ministers thoroughly weeded and swept, wit, merit, and learning rewarded, all disgraces of the press in prose and verse condemned, to eat nothing but their own cotton, and quench their thirst with their own ink. These, and a thousand other reformations, I firmly counted upon by your encouragement, as indeed they were plainly did deducible from the precipice delivered in my book. And it must be owned, the seven months were a sufficient time to correct every vice and folly to which yahoos are subject, if their natures had been capable of the least disposition to virtue or wisdom. Yet, so far have you been from answering my expectation in any of your letters, that, on the contrary, you are loading our carrier every week with libels and keys and reflections and memoirs and second parts, wherein I see myself accused of reflecting upon great state folk, of degrading human nature, for so they still have the confidence to style it, and of abusing the female sex. I find likewise that the writers of those bundles are not agreed among themselves, for some of them will not allow me to be the author of my own travels, and others make me author of books to which I am wholly a stranger. I find likewise that your printer has been so careless as to confound the times and mistake the dates of my several voyages and returns, neither assigning the true year, nor the true month, nor day of the month, and I hear the original manuscript is all destroyed since the publication of my book, neither have I any copy left. However, I have sent you some corrections, which you may insert, if ever there should be a second edition, and yet I cannot stand to them but shall leave that matter to my judicious and candid readers to adjust it as they please. I hear some of our sea yahoos find fault with my sea language, as not proper in many parts, nor now in use. I cannot help it. In my first voyages while I was young, I was instructed by the oldest mariners, and learned to speak as they did. But I have since found that the sea yahoos are apt, like the land ones, to become newfangled in their words which the latter change every year, insomuch as I remember upon each return to my own country, their old dialect was so altered that I could hardly understand the new. And I observe, when any yahoo comes from London, out of curiosity to visit me at my house, we neither of us are able to deliver our conceptions in a manner intelligible to the other. If the censure of the yahoos could any way affect me, I should have great reason to complain, that some of them are so bold as to think my book of travels a mere fiction out of my own brain, and have gone so far as to drop hints, that the Huinonhems and Yahoos have no more existence than the inhabitants of Utopia. Indeed, I must confess, that as to the people of Lilliput, Bodingrag, for so the word should have been spelt, and not erroneously Brobdingnag, and Laputa, 
I have never yet heard any 